force this person. Um, so I'll go ahead and make a couple of comments. We're still probably waiting for a few people to show up. Uh, we always have a guest lecturer today, so Dr. Pongu is going to uh, give the lecture today on accelerated MR techniques. And so uh, hopefully at this point in the class, you have a pretty good understanding of sort of like just all the steps behind doing conventional Cartesian uh, imaging, uh, phase encoding, and all the steps that lead up to needing to do phase encoding to then reconstruct images. Uh, and Dr. Hu is mostly going to talk about ways that we can image even more quickly. We have this problem in MR, right, that it's in some sense a relatively slow imaging modality. So imaging speed has always been uh, you know, something that needed uh, additional work. Uh, very early on, it started off with hardware development. How do we improve the hardware so that the, our gradients are strong enough and fast enough that we can get through the case space quickly? And now there's some really interesting topics and ways of undersampling data and yet still reconstructing a, a useful method. Um, so in just a second, we'll let him start his lecture. I'm still maybe expecting a couple more people. Uh, and then just a few comments about the course overall. Uh, I'll probably step out for part of the lecture, but I have your homework assignment. The third homework assignment is great. You get it back. Everyone did great. Uh, class average was pretty high, 15 points. I forget for sure. I'll double check, but the average was 14 and something. So it was overall, you guys are really picking it up and doing well, which is great. Uh, you've got a lab assignment that you're working on now. If you have questions about that, let me know. I think that's due this Friday. Okay. Uh, so do on Friday, and we'll get those back to you guys pretty quickly. And then you should know really well where you stand in the class before, uh, before the um, final exam. Um, and then we'll get the new, the last homework assignment, we'll get out to you sometime this afternoon or this evening. Uh, and then we'll talk about that a little bit on Wednesday if we want to. So uh, I'll be a little bit in and out for today's lecture, but I'll come back at the very end and get you back to your homework assignments. Uh, with that, Dr. Hu, please. Good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Pong Hu. I'm a, um, I'm a physicist in the radiology department. Okay, so we're going to talk about today accelerated MRI techniques um, that includes parallel imaging and compressed sensing. So raise your hand if you heard about these any one of these two terms so far. It's pretty good. Uh, so we're going to get into more a little bit more details how you know how these techniques work. And, you know, the parallel imaging, for example, in particular, is really um, one of the most widely used techniques in the MR community, both in the clinical and research uh, setting. And um, these are very exciting developments uh, within the last decade. Uh, I hope I can summarize some of the essence of it uh, within a short lecture, and you know, we'll, we can provide some more readings uh, after the lecture if you want. Okay, so as Dr. Ennis was mentioning, MRI is really, really um, a great image modality, but it has, has its weaknesses as well. Um, one of them is, uh, you know, it's got relatively low signal level. If you look at the polarization level in, in PPM for these uh, for biological tissues, so um, and you know, to overcome this low signal level, typically what we can do is we can do a higher field strength. You know, go from going from one point five tesla to three t is going to theoretically double the SNR available. And if you go to 70, it's going to be even higher. So, uh, and and they improve your detection. That means you know higher quality coils, um, better signal coil design, and you know these are still very active research area uh, to this day. Um, and um, the other problem with MR, which we're, we're going to deal with today, is actually MR is relatively slow imaging modality. Uh, the, the reason for that is because it's very slow to encode. If you think you know you're in a case space, right? At any given time point. You can only be at one location case space, right? Because you, you know the case space location is really determined by your gradient in all three axes. And up to one point, you got only one sort of M zero or area under the curve for the gradient for any axis, and that determines the case space location. So that really, you know, is, I think is the bottleneck for MRI. It can only be one location at a time, and. Um, uh, compared to digital camera, if you take a picture, snap, and they got you know whatever million millions of voxels, pixels, just one one single shot. Uh, MRI doesn't work that way, and um, and then slow repetition time. You know TR, the whatever repetition time, and these are slow on milliseconds to tens of milliseconds level. And that 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 can be bottleneck as well. And the relaxation times are constant. 
the constants are long. You're talking about T2 of blood, for example, 1.5 Tesla is about 1200 milliseconds, which means it takes about, you know, about almost three seconds to four seconds before you recover the T1 relaxation time for, for blood signal. And for some other tissues, it might be shorter, but overall, the relaxation times are very long. And uh, uh, that's why sometimes people need contrast agent. We're not going to talk about contrast agent today, but these are just a brief summary of some of the uh, problems of MRI that people are sort of trying to improve on. Okay. Uh, gradients are pretty good these days you know, after decades of development. Um, just one simple example, if you compare, you know, for example, you want to see somebody's coronary artery to see whether there's coronary artery stenosis or occlusion of the artery, then if you do a CT scan, it really takes several seconds. Sometimes, you know, a couple of seconds, you can, you can get a very high quality CT images uh, for the coronary arteries. For MRI, even with the most state-of-the-art techniques, it takes about five to, anywhere from five to 10 uh, minutes to do that. So it's really quite slow compared to CT. Um, now, so how do, how, do, how do we make it faster? Well, we have to start with grading and coding. So we, you should be familiar with this equation by now. This is a, your case space signal, all right? And the K is your case space, uh, uh, your, your, your case space. And here is a Fourier encoding part, all right? This is a complex exponential with uh, K and R. R is your spatial box or uh, space. So the MXY here is really your, your signal for every voxel, all right? And you can see that, again, this is a one-to-one -one correspondence between case-based location and MR signal. And um, so the speed MR is really dependent on how fast you travel in the case space, all right? Um, I'm, I'm gonna skip, skip here, basically, these just tell you that, you know, to make the MRI faster, there's only so much you can do with making faster gradients because of limitations in SAR and peripheral stimulation. I hope you guys heard of these two terms. Okay, SAR is your, uh, sorry, not SAR, uh, 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 stimulations of your, your nerves and how that determines how fast you can ramp up the gradients, okay? And the maximum gradients, there's this sort of energy limitation there because you cannot make the gradients amplitude to be infinite. There has to be some limit there. So. There's the very tight limits there, and um, and there's only not uh, so much you can do. So I'm gonna speak, skip all this because I think you all know this. Um, alternatives here, that's what topic topic today is parallel imaging and compressed sensor. So how does parallel imaging work? Well, if you look at an MRI, for example, here is a, a brain image, all right? And if you use the, the body coil of the scanner, then you get some images like this, all right? But most likely, if you go to MRI scan today, um, they're going to use not the whole body coil, but more more specialized coil. If you scan the head, it's going to be head coil, okay? The head coil has multiple elements in there, all right? Anywhere from maybe you know, 16 into 32 channels. Um, so this is just one example, four, four channels. So these are the same image taken at the same time, but from different elements of the same coil, okay? You can see that these elements, they have they have a little bit different coil sensitivity here. This coil has a little bit um, higher sensitivity to this region. Presumably, that geometrically, this coil is more you know, spatially localized to this area, okay? And that coil is more on the other side. So you can see they're a little, little bit different. So they look at the same thing, sort of look at the same thing from a different angle, per se. Um, and and to, to continue, so what is, what is the source of noise in MRI in general? Uh, there are two types, okay? Um, one is your home, human uh, your body. When you scan a subject, um, there is random <coughs> random motion of the uh, molecules, and, and that that translates to noise, like more like a white noise from your body, all right? And, and the other part is electronics. So like all the coils, all the hardware, all the preamps, amplifiers, the filters, A to D converters, all these contribute to noise. But because these electronics these days are so good, I think at field strength of like 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla, the dominant noise source is in the human body, okay? Uh, the, I'm talking noise here because in later you'll see that noise uh, is very related to sort of parallel imaging. They're, they're, they're very, uh, parallel imaging, you know, basically suffers from this noise loss. And, uh, we'll talk about that. So let's get back to the multi-coil reconstruction. So again, you have four coils here. All right, and uh, so these are 
colors can still be light. Okay, the brighter region means that this color is more sensitive to this region to pick up signal from here. But it's not sensitive to here because it's a very small signal. It's, and it's kind of far away from the coil. So when you get far, further and further away, then the coil gets less sensitive to that particular region. How do, how do we use that information? Well, first of all, uh, without doing parallel imaging, it's, you know, just by using the coil array itself, that can improve your SNR uh, quite substantially compared to body coil. Okay? Think about the reason why. All right? Uh, one common way to do that is, okay, if you have four coils, for example, what I do is, I'm going to take some of the squares. So we're going to square each one of these voxels, all right? And they add up all these squared voxels, uh, voxel intensities, and they add them together, and they take a square root of that, okay? That usually gives them pretty uniform emissions like this, okay? But doing that, now, so far there's no parallel imaging involved, but because doing that, we can improve the SNR um, because, because these coils are, um, you know, they're, they're not sensitive to the entire region. So they're not sensitive to here. For example, here, coil is not sensitive to here, and it's not sensitive to the ball, to the noise here as well. So if there's noise here, it's not going to be picked up by that particular coil element. So that's why these surface arrays or more specialized multi-coil arrays, they improve your SNR compared to the body coil. Let's keep that in mind. That's one benefit without uh, parallel imaging. Now, um, well, you might ask, okay, if we can make a coil sensitivity like this, right? So it's perfect square. Within a square, it's perfect one. And if outside square, it's perfect zero. Then the problem is solved. What you can do is, okay, you can just put the four coils on this uh, head and then around this head. And then uh, each coil is going to pick up a quarter of the image and just put them together, right? But in reality, it doesn't work that way um, because the coil sensitivity is so because coil sensitivity is really, really smooth in space, there's no way you can make it just that sharp transition from zero to one just instantaneously. That creates a problem. That's why you know parallel imaging has to be used. So uh, let's get back to the similar equation, okay? Um, so this is a similar equation here we saw before, and these are only for like if you use a body coil, all right? Now if you use phase array coil, we have multiple coil elements. Then there's another term here. This is a coil sensitivity term, okay? What it means is that basically every voxel, if you look at a signal that you received for coil number gamma, all right, that signal um, is basically is modulated by the coil sensitivity of that channel gamma for every location. So every location of this, the real signal is here, but the signal has to be multiplied or weighted by the coil sensitivity at that same location by that coil first before you can do a Fourier decoding, okay? So you can imagine, that's why um, for every different coil, the signal you get is different, although you're imaging the same subject, okay? Yeah. Just really quickly, just so everyone's on the same page, uh, when we talked about a similar equation, we had this, what I'll just call it C gamma for each coil gamma, we called it B, or it was the B receive field, so you could call it B R sub gamma or something like that, but the coil sensitivity to the B receive field are the same things. Um, to to uh, to make it simple, let's just start with a simpler form. Let's say because the, you know in a typical image we have x and y directions, and we're not doing any, uh, any parallel imaging in a readout direction. Okay, uh, we only do parallel imaging in a y or phase encoded direction. So to, for simplicity, let's just say okay, we do one D simplification. Uh, let's say that this the object is not a two D object, but it's just one D object in a, in a phase encoded direction in a y direction. Okay, so your mxy of r uh, becomes now m of y. Okay, that's your signal. And there's a free, free uh, kernel in a y direction only. And again, this is a, a b of c, a b of uh, uh, gamma, channel gamma, of coil sensitivity, again, as a function of space in y. Uh, and we know, of course, everything we do in uh, MRI is in a discrete form because it's all computerized or digitalized. So, uh, if you do that, basically the integration becomes a summation, right? And then again, the coil sensitivity is here. Uh, these are u is discrete numbers from one to zero to n minus one. N is the number of uh, voxels for imaging, okay? And this again, this is your signal and the free free encoding. The, the free kernel here uh, is uv divided by n and times two pi. It's a phase angle. 
I hope you guys are familiar with this. Um, any any questions? This is very important for you to understand before we move ahead. Okay. All right. Um, let's just simplify this a little bit. And you know, these are a lot of equations. So let's say we have two voxels. All right. And um, um, the single equation is the same. The only difference here is that now all of a sudden n becomes two. So the u is only either either zero or one. All right. And then um, and the rest is the same. So what would be the signal if you if you okay if you have two voxels, these are signal uh, intensity of uh, each voxel is a and b, um, and what would be the k space signal for you know k space has to has two points right as well if you do a Fourier transform that. Um, what is the zero frequency component of k space? Can anybody anybody volunteer? Answer that question. You just sum. need to follow the equation here. It's the sum of that. Yeah, the sum there, exactly. That's the sum of A and B, all right? Because you think about it, the first one, so V is zero, and so this term goes away, all right? And U basically, so basically S of one, S of zero is basically the sum of M of zero and M of one. And M of zero is A, so A and B, okay? Uh, what about the other one? Because if you do first term, you need two points. What is the other point in your case? What's the value of that? Zero. 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 Excuse me? One. How do you make uh, things of one? You need to follow the exact same location, but now it's V is instead of a zero, now V is one. So this term doesn't go away anymore. Speak up, please. Just a difference, right? A minus B. Yes, A minus B, that's right. So, because again, the phase modulation, U is one, when V, v is one, when U is also one, then the N is two, so the two cancel out. So this is a pi phase difference for the second, for the second box, okay? So it's A minus B. It's very simple, all right? So what you do, okay, you have a system of uh, linear equations, two equations, okay? Now, S0 and S1 are your measure signal. You know these signals because you measured it using your coils, right? And you're looking for, you don't know A and B. You want to find out what A and B are, okay? So, but you know this signal is A plus B, that signal is A minus B. So I think it's pretty straightforward to figure out what A and B are, okay? But mathematically, what's happening, basically, you, you need to... Uh, so this matrix here, if you put it on the left side of the equation, it's going to be this matrix times the A and B as a vector, that equal to a measure signal. So how do you calculate A and B? Well, you just invert that matrix here. So that's what I'm doing here. And that matrix inversion is here, so it's easy to figure that out. Okay, so in this case, A is basically um, the, the, the signal add them together and divide by 2. Okay, B is, you, just, you know, subtract them and divide by 2. Okay, simple enough. All right, a little bit more complicated. Four voxels. Um, what is the S of zero? Yes, the same principle, okay? We're gonna go a little bit quicker here. What about S of one? You have to look up for the pattern. This term is the key here. What? It's A minus IB minus C minus plus IB. So what's happening is for, for the second second k space, every term is still a b c d. But every term you have a ninety degree uh, phase shift, minus ninety degree phase shift. The, the phase shift comes from here. So literally, that's what happened. Uh, if you follow the same uh, rule, what would be the s of two?
Anyone? Okay. Yes. So there's a, instead of I or 90 degree shift, and now we have 180 degree shift between these, each of these two. So it's going to be A minus B plus C because this is a two pass shift. It's back to the same phrase. And minus B. Okay, this is 200, uh, uh, sorry, 540. Okay. Um, last one. Same pattern. Now instead of a 180 degree shift, we're going to have a 270 degree shift. So it's plus i minus minus i. Okay? It's so minus 270 degree, which is equivalent to 90 degree positive. So uh, that's for a voxel case. Um, and what I'm trying to tell you is that these are standard Fourier encoding. Okay, if you look at the equations here, obviously it gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, the encoding matrix before it was two by two, now it's four by four. Okay, but these are still what we call the Fourier encoding matrix. This is a very, it's an often normal matri uh, matri uh, matri uh, matrix, and uh, you can invert it very easily. Okay, you follow the same thing. You have four uh, linear equations to solve, and these are S zero to S three are your measured data. And you're looking for solving for A, B, C, D. And what you do is you invert this encoding matrix and the inversion of the matrix times the measure signal vector that give you your, your, what you're looking for. Okay. So everything is, is good so far is there's no, you know, that's basically just for encoding. There's nothing fancy about this. Okay. But I wanted you guys to sort of get some sense of what's happening uh, when, when, uh, when you do this. Uh, all these are without power emission. Um, now, it gets a little, little bit more complicated, you have multiple coils. So all of a sudden, you have a signal from coil 1 and a signal from coil 2. And each coil, you have this four case-based locations, right? So, but but the, the signal has to be weighted by the coil sensitivity of that particular coil. So if you look at case space number, uh, so zero location case space for coil 1, it's going to be both A, B, C, D, but each one is going to be weighted by the coil sensitivity for that for the voxel. You then follow the same pattern, okay? This phase shifts here. And you do the same thing for coil number two. But here, the weighting factor is C2 now, it's not C1. So, so these signals are different. Although they are all have this, they are all signal from the same case, for the same case this location. The different signal because the coil sensitivity is different. All right, so um, why I'm showing this? Well, if you look at the equation here, all of a sudden you have eight measurements. Remember, you have four case space locations that have two coils, right? So you have eight measurements, but you're looking for four unknowns. So this is what we call over-determining problem. You have more measurements than the number of unknowns, okay? Um, so immediately think about that. Okay, if it's over-determined, maybe it's redundant. Yes, it is true. It's actually redundant. So how 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 do we get you know how do we um, get rid of redundancy? Well, um, we started with one coil and now we have two coils. So you cannot go back to one coil. It doesn't make any sense. So the other way to get rid of redundancy is okay. Maybe we can skip the case space locations. So instead of sampling four locations of case space, now let's just sample two locations. Okay. So let's get rid of two lines here. So we're sampling only locations zero and two. 0 and 2 for coil 1 and coil 2. If you do that, now the equation becomes basically uh, 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 close back to a 4 by 4 again. So it's not really over determined anymore. Okay? And if you follow the same rule, then okay. Now the, the encoding here, this is called a sensitivity encoding because you can see it's not strictly Fourier encoding anymore because these coefficients in the matrix they all have the coil sensitivity. They're not just zero and ones or, or minus ones. They have coil sensitivity for each individual coil there. All right. And if you follow the same rule, okay, let's say I have the measurement here, okay, and I'm looking for the unknowns of two coils and two case space locations. Let's just invert this matrix. That's essentially what parallel imaging is all about. It's, it's an inverting process because you have these number of measurements and you have sensitivity encoding matrix 
then what you need to do is simply just invert this matrix and that and multiply it by the measurement that give you the the um, um, the, the what you're looking for the, the box of values here. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than Fourier encoding because I'll talk about that. Uh, the matrix here is not that straightforward to invert it. So, but before we talk about the uh, inversion, uh, let's talk about what's happening when to the image when you do this. Remember, we're skipping two case space lines. So, in the four voxel case, you're supposed to sample four locations in the case space, but we're skipping every other one. So, we sample zero and a two, and we skip. One and uh, sorry, uh, we'll skip one and three, right? So when you do that, what's going to happen? That means for the lines number one and lines number three in case space, you're basically putting zero there because you don't know that you didn't measure it. You put this zero there and you do, you do an inverse for the transform. What's going to happen to the image? I think you guys should know about this. It's basically a, a coding alias. Aliasing, exactly. So that means because you're skipping the case space. You do, you're not meeting the Nyquist sampling rate. So your image is supposed to look like this, but because you're sampling like that, then it's aliased. So the top part goes back to the bottom. The bottom the part, cutoff part is going to go back to the top. Okay? That's what's, what's happening here. So now, here creates a problem. How, obviously, you cannot use an image like this. We have to un-alias it, how to, you know, how, to, how to do that. That's the job of how image. Okay, I'll show you later. When you invert that matrix here, uh, you're basically, effectively, you're on any single image. Okay. So here's a, um, a technique called sense. This is really uh, one of the first um, uh, most widely used uh, technique, uh, power imaging. And I think it's, it's very sort of general framework for power imaging for any other power imaging techniques. Um, what it does is, again, we have multiple coils. All right, this object, and we skip the case based lines. Every other line, if we indicate this is, you know, rate two acceleration, and we have alias images. But we have alias images for each coils, and these images are different. See that because this coil is close to here, so um, the uh, the uh, actually my switched. So the, the signal intensity is different. The alias part is different because the coil geometry is. Different. And what we do is now we're going to input all these, feed all these into the uh, 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 sense reconstruction here. That's basically the same matrix we showed in the previous slide. Okay, we're inverting this matrix and then time the uh, uh, multiplied by the vector of the measure signal that gives you the, uh, the signal intensity. And, uh, and remember, these, once you have ABCD, that means it's not alias anymore. Right? If it's alias image, you only got two, two numbers. Okay, because you're solving four already, that means it's only unlinked by definition. All right, uh, that's what what's happening in sense. Okay, and 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 the inversion here. The inversion here is called the pseudo inversion because this matrix is not orthonormal matrix. It means that you know it doesn't have a well defined uh, inversion like the Fourier and Cody matrix uh, because the coelacity uh, parameter depends on the coelacity. A profile C is C1 and C2 here. Um, when you invert it, you, you're going to amplify more noise. That's well known in the sort of mathematical world of maths. Um, the problem with this encoding strategy is, you know, we give example of four voxels, but if you think about it in reality, what is a typical image size that we're looking for, looking at? Or if you do an image, look at a brain, what do you think? 256 by 256, maybe? That's sort of standard. Okay, now um, that's how many voxels. That's, that's a lot of voxels there. So, so you can you can imagine for for sorry for four voxel here, the encoding matrix four voxel and the two uh, channels two coils is four by four. If you're talking about two fifty six by two fifty six uh, voxels, the, you vectorize it into a single vector. That's a lot of elements there, and so you can imagine that that encoding matrix here is going to be huge. So in this particular example, that size is going to be, if, let's say you have 32 channels, that's more like the more state-of-the-art sort of coil design, then the size is this by this, okay? And you just use a brute force to, uh, brute force to uh, invert this thing, it's going to take you forever to do that. 
even if you use a, a Watson computer or something, I, you know, it's, it's going to be hard to do. Okay. So, so directly inversion is not going to work for this kind of matrices. Um, but there is a um, there's a simplification possible when you do Cartesian sampling. I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, but for non-Cartesian, do you guys know Cartesian, non-Cartesian sampling in general? Like non-Cartesians are like a spiral radial sampling and stuff like that, where the sampling are not falling on the grid points uh, in, in case phase. Um, it turns out if it's non-Cartesian, inverting this matrix can be very tricky to do. <coughs> There's algorithms out there that you can numerically solve it. <coughs> But for Cartesian, there's a simplification. Okay. Um, so let's focus a little bit more on, on Cartesian. Um, so what's happening in Cartesian? Again, the same example, let's say you have uh, two rate acceleration. Okay, you under, under sample the case space by two uh, in, the X, uh, in the left and right direction. All right. And this is your coil sensitivity coil number one. All right. And because you're under sampling, then you have aliasing in that direction. And what's nice about Cartesian sampling is that um, you know this voxel here, when you're on the sample by rate 2, it's going to be alias exactly on that voxel. Not here, not here, not here, on that little voxel. So these two voxels are only, basically, they're sort of, they're forming a group. They don't, they don't interact with other voxels. So they over, over, overlap each other in the alias image shown here. So this voxel value is basically is it's a sum of the value from here and here. Okay, it's it's this it's, it's associated with some uh, other voxel. That's why it makes it simple for Cartesian sense because of this. Well, you see that later. Um, but let's keep going. Let's say coil number one is like this, and uh, your signals are really remember the signal here. Okay, your signal of R one. R one is this location, right? Channel number one is the a linear combination of these two voxels, I R1, I R2. So this is R1 location, this is R2 location, okay? Uh, but they are weighted by the coil sensitivity for the current channel, number one. Um, if you look at channel number two, like the same story, but just weighting is, is a little bit different. Instead of coil number one, you're weighted by coil number two, okay? Now it's, you know, if you do the same thing for, for let's say four coils, this is basically you're forming another systems of linear equations here, and you follow the same um, strategy we did before. Basically, what you want to do is just you want to invert this matrix. Okay, so remember this is measure signal. This is your encoding matrix, and this is your um, your what you're solving for. But what's nice about this is that look at the dimension here. What you're solving for in this case, you only have two unknowns, R1 and R2, because you know that these two voxels form, they form a group, they alias onto each other. They don't alias to any other voxels, and any other voxels don't alias onto them either. That's, that's why we can simplify this thing. Instead of having a long, gigantic vector of you know, tens of thousands of elements, you got, you got two here. Okay? And once you do that, then we can follow the same rule, we just invert this. But this matrix, again, it, it's not directly invert invertible, but we call it a pseudo-inverse, okay? Um, it's, 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 it's doable, and once you inverse it, and you can calculate the i's. And you can do the same thing for every pair of voxels, right? You have, you have you know, 256 by 256 voxels, and you, you do this on, for every pair, okay? So that basically breaks down the big problem inverting a gigantic matrix into a whole bunch of much, much smaller problems to solve. That saves you a lot of time. So that's why it's, it's, it's perfectly doable if it's a Cartesian sampling sense, but for non-Cartesian, you have to think about something else. Okay, any questions? All right, so, so we know about sense now, and um, there's some issues about sense. We talked about noise before. Um, the natural question is, if you use a sense, then what, what, what does that mean for your SNR image, okay? We all know SNR is related to several things, right? It's, for example, if you, long, if you take a longer time to sample the case space, then you get higher SNR, right? If it takes shorter, then you get lower SNR. So in this case, because 
for if you do way too sampling, uh, under sampling, that means you're spending really 50% of your time sampling the case space. Um, you spend half the time, so your SNR is going to go down because of that. But in addition to that, so that's this term here. Square root, of, square root of the R, that's your penalty associated with a reduced sampling time. But on top of that, you have another uh, penalty in SNR, which is a G here, what we commonly refer to G factor. Okay, so what's happening is when you invert the matrix, uh, the encoding matrix, the, the, uh, because the matrix is not orthonormal, all right, when you invert it, you amplify the noise. Okay, that's where G comes from. So G is always greater than one. And if you have, you want to design a coil that has lower G factor, uh, as, uh, lower G factor so that you don't, you don't uh, penalize uh, your SNR as much. Okay. And the G factor really depends on how your coils are designed and how they are positioned and et cetera. There's a lot of factors that can determine this. Um, for, you know, for a simple case, for R equal to one, so that means there's no acceleration, then G naturally is one, right? For an application where R is equal to two, typically, you know, it's, it's common to see G factor, you know, in the neighborhood of 1.5, sometimes a little bit less when you develop better coils. Um, and another thing is that SNR is spatially dependent. That's, that's a phenomenon that you don't see that in a traditional Fourier encoding. When you do a Fourier encoding, you're assuming all the noise are, are white noise, and when you do a Fourier, uh, Fourier transform of that, then still, it's not spatially dependent. It's, that's not the same everywhere, supposedly, theoretically, okay? But because you're parallel imaging, all of a sudden, the G factor is dependent on location. Typically, at the location spots where you're farther away from all the coil elements, the G factor there tends to be higher. That means SNR in this region can be lower, okay? Um, so, yeah, so, so at the uh, sensitivity encoding matrix condition, that's, that's basically related to G factor, okay? That matrix has its own condition that depends on a coil sensitivity, uh, depends on a case based on the sampling pattern, it depends on your uh, coil geometry and the sensitivity, all these things. Um, let's just give you one example of uh, sort of some G factors uh, here. So this is, the pad is parallel imaging in the Siemens uh, world. We call it pad, it's just parallel imaging. Uh, think about it the sense, okay? Um, this is reference scan using 12 channel head coil, right? And if you do uh, two rate acceleration, uh, you can see you lose a little bit uh, SNR, gets a little bit noisy, but really it gets a lot noisier when you do uh, rate four. Okay, um, that's because, you know, basically there's no free lunch. When you do parallel imaging, you save time, but you could lose SNR. So really, if, you know, when you think about parallel imaging, you have to think about sort of trade-offs between these two. Uh, this is one example of G-factor map. It's actually a one over G map. So uh, you, want, you want G to be low, so you want one over, one over G to be uh, high, okay? So in this case, you can see that uh, this is phantom, um, and these are, these are basically the, the simulation results, okay, of number of elements here. Um, these 16, 32, and, and uh, infinity, uh, supposedly. And we see that when you go, a uh, number of elements goes up, your G factor performance gets better, okay? That usually happens. Uh, that's why, you know, people are pushing more and more number of channels just because of that, you know, have, you get better performance in parallel region, okay? Um, these these are these are um, some some example images are taken from uh, Prusman's paper in 1999, uh, showing that the sense reconstruction when you have rate goes up, you know the, the noise obviously it gets uh, much much more noisy. And these are G maps actually, uh, measure G maps. You can see that uh, at rate one is basically uniform one, ever 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 the same. I guess two it's not too bad, but you really. It can be, you know, quadratic increase when you go to from like 2.4 to 3 and 3 to 4. It, it gets back pretty quickly. Okay. So that's why there's a limit there. You cannot say, I want to accelerate my images by 16 fold. Well, you can do that, but you're going to get very, very uh, <clears throat> noisy and crappy images. So that there's a trade-off there. Um, and typically we're talking about for the modern, so state-of-the-art uh, MR scans, um, the, uh, the 
acceleration factor anywhere from two to four or five or six. That's sort of the upper limit. Okay. Okay, any questions? Okay, this is just actually an another example showing that the the uh, the one over g factor map and the corresponding images. You can see that in areas where you have um, low one over g, it's kind of confusing, which means high g value. So these regions you can see noisy. I don't know whether you can see well noisy images here uh, compared to say images here. So you can see that first of all, SNR is spatially dependent. It's more noisy in this region and less noisy in the in the, in the front region here. Um, and also, it is correlated with the G factor. So, um, problems, you know, SNR is always important for power imaging. Uh, there's always people looking for better ways, better coil designs, and better reconstruction algorithms, uh, um, and also better sort of estimation of coil sensitivities. Uh, remember, power imaging is whole family of techniques and I just showed the example how sense works because this sense is really the most sort of generic framework for all power imaging but um, there you know there's 10 plus years of literature on power imaging and different algorithms uh, they are more or less based on the same principle um, you can tell you know the reconstruction process the process of inverting the matrix really depends a lot on your coil sensitivity <clears throat> estimation you want to get very accurate coil sensitivity, the more accurate the better, because you know that inaccuracies in your coil sensitivity measurement is going to basically translate to your uh, degraded uh, image quality or image reconstruction quality. Uh, just a couple of words on how do you measure the coil sensitivity. Well, you, what you can do is you could, um, you could you know, put a coil on a, on a patient and then you scan the acquired image and you repeat the same sequence but instead of using a, a, a red coil, we use a body coil. We know that body coil has a very uniform uh, coil uh, sensitivity across the region of interest uh, field of view. And uh, so what you do is basically you divide the magnitude of each individual coil element <coughs> image by the, uh, the body coil images. So that's how you can sort of coil sensitivity maps like this. And there's, you know, if you just do raw division, it's going to be something like this. It's not going to be very smooth because there's a noise there, all kinds of things. Uh, typically, people do uh, smoothing, they spatially smooth this out because we know these coil sensitivities, they should be very, very smooth in space. So if you're getting sharp edges or sharp jumping up and downs, then that means you're not getting accurate uh, uh, coil sensitivities. So there's some process in there. Uh, people use polynomials and things like that to sort of make it smooth, and that can have impact. You know, if you don't do it, uh, this is a P is a, sort of the uh, smoothing, the degree of smoothing you get that you use. If you don't use any smoothing, just use a raw coefficient and you get something like this after a sensory construction. But if you smooth it out before you do the uh, recon, then you get you know, improved images. Okay, so, so. As I said, sense is the, really the most generic way, uh, sort of framework. Um, it's it's an, an example of a category of power imaging methods called uh, uh, image space-based methods. Uh, there are a whole um, other uh, category called case-based power imaging methods. They're, these are, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this, but these two categories are, you know, uh, very, very, it's not similar in the reconstruction, but it's based on the same principle. Uh, you know, if you uh, if you if you understand this power imaging case space based methods, basically they're they're uh, at the end of the day, it's basically you're still inverting matrix, but just in a, in a little bit different way. Okay. It's got its advantages as well. So um, to understand these techniques, we we have to go back to the signal equation um, here. So. What you do is, okay, um, let's say this equation here, let's just review here. This is a case based uh, signal, all right? This is for channel gamma. Again, this is your coil sensitivity, your signal for encoding. Now, hypothetically, if we can come up with a linear combination that, uh, of the coil sensitivities, okay, for, for, for this, for different coils. So, and 
gamma is the weighting factor for channel gamma. All right, this is a linear combination of oil of the um, uh, corner sensitivity profiles. Okay, let's say if we have if we if we know such a linear combination such that when you combine these together, you get a perfect complex exponential as function of space, or you know sinusoidal wave basically as function of space. I'll show you some examples in the next slide. But if that's true, then something interesting is happening. So if you look at equation here, so um, it's your case-based signal, right, for different channels. If you combine the case-based measurements of all these channels together using the exactly same linear uh, weighting factor, and you combine them together and go through the math, okay, I'll just go through here a little bit. So you, you, you know that this signal is the integration of your uh, the case space measurement is integration signal and your coil sensitivity and your Fourier kernel, and you swap the integration and, uh, and summation sign here, put the integration on the side, and see this thing here. This will be very familiar. Basically, we said here, if that's true, that means you're applying the same linear combination uh, coefficients on the coil sensitivities, okay? And that equals to this one. So if you substitute, you get basically m of y and the Fourier encoding kernel here, but it, you know instead of just a ky here, you have a little uh, added term delta ky here. Okay, and so that means basically when you, if you look at from here to here, that tells you that if you do a linear combination of uh, the same locate the same case signal, a case based signal for multiple channels. Okay, if this condition satisfies. Then you basically, when you do that, you get the what you would have measured at a different case based location. Although you, you didn't measure it, but you could calculate it. So that's interesting. So that means, you know, since I can calculate it, I don't need to measure this anymore, right? Uh, I can just calculate this one from uh, a signal I measure from another case based location. Remember, you can only be at one the case based location at a time. So that directly translates to uh, time savings, your acquisition. So this is, you know, this is this is really the core of, of case space based uh, parallel imaging and how it works. Um, I'll show you show you some examples actually here. Um, so a little bit more details here. Again, this is a linear combination of coil number one and number two of this acquired line in case space. Okay, it shows if you can synthesize such an exponential complex exponential here, if that's true. All right, then you combine these two coils using, using the same coefficients, then basically you, you can calculate this line. See that it's dashed line here? It's not, it's, not, it's not acquired, but you can calculate it. And the distance here is delta ky, okay? That delta ky is really determined by uh, this delta ky here. I know it's a lot of math, but I think it's very important uh, for you to understand this is a, uh, Really, as the essence of uh, case space based parallel imaging methods. Um, so, now th the big question is the whole thing is based on a hypothesis that you can, you can synthesize a, a sinusoidal uh, coil sensitivity map based on a real coil sensitivity map. How true is that? Right? You, cannot, you cannot, for example, if you have some frequencies of uh, if you have very slow changing coil sensitivity maps, you have you know you have ten or twenty of them, but they are all very slow in space. Okay, then it doesn't sound likely if you combine them in a linear way, you can generate like highly fracturing coil sensitivity. It's it's not going to work. You know that the fit quality is going to be very poor if you do that. So there's a limitation there in terms of how much um, how much Frequency. Uh, what is the frequency that you can generate for the for the for the composite uh, coil sensitivity map? Basically, remember this delta ky really determines the frequency, right? The delta ky is bigger. That means your your attempt, your spatial frequency is fluctuating uh, quickly, more quickly. Okay. So there's a limitation there. Um, this just this is taken from one the the original. Uh, paper from Sodex and it's called Smash, and uh, this is really the first case-based uh, power imaging method, 
And so you can see that basically, you know, this is an array of coils, okay? One, two, three, four, so eight coils here. And they all have little coil sensitivities here, just spatially localized. See the little uh, close to sinusoidal waves here? And, you know, basically what we're asking you to do is, can you come up with a, a linear <clears throat> coefficient so that when you combine these things, you can get either a constant or cosine or sine waveforms, okay? And uh, these are possible, all right? But, you know, as I was mentioning before, you cannot create any arbitrary sinusoidal wave with any arbitrary frequency because of the limitation there, okay? And remember, that limitation corresponds to how, how much you can jump in k-space. If you have this line, you cannot say, I'm going to calculate the k-space for that line because it's too big a jump and your, your, your synthesized waveform doesn't support that. You can maybe jump a little, and that's, that's another limitation of this kind of technique is that you have to be really careful about that. Um, that's, that's the smash technique. Uh, um, up to here is a very similar to the sense you just under sample in case space, okay? And then there's the auto calibration step. Uh, that's something, you know, different from sense. Why do you need auto calibration? Well, if you go back here, remember these coefficients. We're gonna need these coefficients, but we don't know how, what, what they are. I mean, you know, how, how do you know what linear weighting factor you should use for each channel? So the way to do that is you calculate these ends uh, from the outer cal calibration step. Uh, basically what you do is, you know, you're skipping every other line, right? But in the center of k-space where there's a lot of k-space signal energy, then you, you acquire maybe a couple more lines, okay? And what you do is, okay, you gotta ask yourself, if I have this line here, let me have an example maybe next year. So here, yeah. So let's say I acquire this line, okay, for both coils. I know that I want to find out N1s and N2s so that when you combine these coil sensitivities at this location, uh, you're going to get a, uh, uh, a uh, sinusoidal wave with the frequency corresponding to this jump, okay? You know, this is delta K, right? So but because you already have this measure data, so that makes it easy. You just need to invert that little matrix there, right? You, you know, you're solving for N1 and N2, basically. What kind of N1 and N2 is gonna, is gonna give you that measure data uh, using the linear combination of N1, uh, these two coils, uh, uh, coil sensitivity profiles. Okay, so that's the auto calibration process. And once you, once you calibrate, okay, that means you already know what N1 and N2 is, and then what you need to do is just basically apply the same N1 and N2 throughout the case space. You know, you know how to calculate from here to here, right? Because you already calibrated. And the next step is to calculate from here to here, from here to here, here to here, and so on and so forth. So you're going to fill out the entire case space. But this cal auto calibration step is very important because that enables you to calculate the N1s and the linear coefficients. There are different variations of SMASH, and there's a later variation called GRAPA, which is actually very widely used as well and in different platforms. Um, and, but just several special notes here. Uh, we're not going to go to sort of more details about how this is, but just this is a conclusion that SMASH is actually a very special case of SENSE. As I said, SENSE is the most generic framework of parallel imaging, and all the other parallel imaging techniques, either is case space based or image-based, the, you know, the fundamentally basically is very similar, it's the same principle, okay? Um, but what's nice about SMASH or parallel or case-based based parallel imaging methods is that they do not require direct measurement of coil sensitivity, which can be hard to do, as you can tell. Um, and these inaccuracies in coil sensitivity is gonna directly translate to uh, image, uh, uh, quality, you know, reconstruction errors, you know, sense reconstruction. But because they are the color calibration step, <clears throat> that kind of takes care of a little bit more about this color sensitivity issue because all these color sensitivities are already absorbed in the auto calibration step uh, where you calculate the, the coefficients. And a minor thing is that, you know, for, for sense reconstruction, when you fill the view, uh, when you prescribe the field of view is smaller than the actual object size, sometimes there's this problem there. Okay, so, so if, 
in summary, for parallel imaging, um, uh, they ha all have a you know their category of different categories of parallel imaging, but they all have share the same characteristics, which is that they use coil sensitivities uh, to speed up the MRI acquisition. The coil sensitivities enables you to uh, <clears throat> solve a redundant problem because of multiple coils and you have multiple copy of management. Um, and uh, but you have to think about you know sort of there are a lot of trade-offs happening in parallel imaging. You're trading the image acquisition speed uh, with SNR. You're losing SNR by doing parallel imaging, uh, for example. Uh, so when when you think about cases of parallel imaging, I think about you know what is acceleration rate I want. You really have to think about what kind of application you know. Um, for for some applications like real-time imaging, where you really want to have a real-time feedback in you know in in a second, you know. 100 milliseconds, then you, you want, the, in this case, the speed is the most important thing. You want to speed up. You can lose maybe a little bit more SNR, but you really want to see what's happening right there. Uh, then you probably want to use higher power, power imaging acceleration factors, for example. <clears throat> uh, but for applications where uh, you can spend a little bit more time, but you really want to get down like small voxel sizes where you know if the SNR is going to suffer, then you have to be maybe cautious about using higher acceleration factors for these applications. So it's always a trade-off there. Uh, you can see that trade-off all the time in you know, clinical application. So, um, rate four, rate three, rate two, which one should I use? And that, that kind of question comes up all the time. Okay, uh, any questions before I move on to compressed sensing? So we take just a few minute break, you know, normal questions, questions for me, Dr. Cohn, rest of the water, and then we'll just start back up in a few minutes. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So basically, <clears throat> because there's a rate two acceleration, mm -hmm. you know that if you if you tell me, okay, I want to know the box, the group, the other group member of this voxel, mm -hmm. what I look for is because rate two, it has to be half a field away from this voxel because of rate two. Okay, so, so based on uh, what kind of rate you are using? Yeah, yeah. So for okay. rate 2, it's always half field of view. Mm -hmm. If the rate 4, for example, then basically you have four voxels overlap, a yeah, group size yeah. becomes four, oh, and it's every quarter field of view. Okay, okay. So that's why, you know, if, if it gets higher mm -hmm. uh, acceleration factors, then mm -hmm. if group size gets bigger, yeah. then you have bigger problems. So. Okay, um, but... Uh, so why like the like overlap or the agency is in this direction or not in this direction? So based on like the like the coding direction. Well, the the agency always happens in the uh, in the phasing coding direction. Okay. And there is never aliasing in the readout direction. Okay. You could, for example, you know, <laughs> if you have an MRI scan, right? If somebody lies uh, in the in the core, and you. You prescribe, for example, a, a, a chrono, you know, chrono slice, mm -hmm. <clears throat> like like this. Yeah. So it's a two D slice, but it's you know, it's one direction is foot to head, mm -hmm. the other direction is left to right. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, and what you can do, so if you think about it, right? So in this case, which one should be your facing coding direction? 
the shorter one. The shorter one, because you know that longer one, there's no alias in there. Yeah. In the readout direction, there is never alias in the readout direction mm -hmm. whatsoever. Okay. Uh, the reason being that I think you should, you guys should talk about the uh, anti aliasing filter. Did you talk about this in the class? Um, I can talk about okay. it. Yeah. Um, maybe. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll maybe I'll, I'll, I'll discuss about this after the break. Okay. Because it sounds like this interesting topic. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the. The whole idea of the parallel image is like so. We just like we know like the, this pixels are impaired, so right. we can for Cartesian only for Cartesian. Yeah, if okay. it's non-Cartesian, mm -hmm. there there's no. If it's non-Cartesian, the entire you know tens of thousand voxels there, it's a big gigantic. Yeah, yeah. That's why it's harder to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, typically, how many colors do we use? Just uh, no, these are simple examples. They, yeah. you, it, we do cardiac scans, for example. We always use we're anywhere from 16 to 32. Okay. So, and there are people developing like 120 and whatever, 200 okay. channels or brains. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so, uh, in, or in clinical analysis or in applications, so how many, like, uh, uh, how fast can we like improve the image, but with relatively high SNR? So, like, to say, how useful is this parallel imaging process to increase the accuracy time? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mean like typical acceleration factor yeah, we use? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, depends on the application. Okay. I think uh, I, I'm more involved in cardiovascular study, mm -hmm. uh, where the, the rate is anywhere from Maybe three, three. three. Sometimes we push for four. So you can do you can do uh, two by two acceleration. Mm -hmm. If you do three D imaging, then all of a sudden you have two phase encoding mm -hmm. So you can accelerate in both directions instead of like you know under sampling rate four in one direction. You can do two in one direction, the other two it always works better. G factor is better. Yeah. So in three D equation is better than. Yeah, yeah, it's really because you have more flexibility, you have, yeah. you have one more dimension where you can undersample. That's okay. always, yeah. Because if you undersample one direction by fours, you're, you're limited by your coil. Yeah. You know, if you think about it, if you undersample in that direction, you have only two coils, then you understand by four, then it's not going to work. Yeah. Okay? Thanks. Um, I don't really understand Okay. So, um, so coming from this step, with this step. Mm -hmm. um, like to express this in terms like this way, don't you? Are okay. you like missing a C gamma version that we so? Like I know this thing into the extension, but I don't. Um, I see what you mean. Yeah, uh, I think I'm a bit confused with the. Yeah, so 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 if you look at the equation here, this one doesn't have a, a gamma in there. So so this is your. So when you know when there's a gamma there is a gamma there. So basically this is the, the real true object. Regardless of your coil system. Okay, okay, so it actually So what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. 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 So if you you know if you go to the very first equation I showed you guys. Um, no, it should be somewhere around there. Oh yeah, maybe this one is it's flipped, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so this one. Like, if there's no mm, cross okay. but if you add cross there's a camera. Okay, okay, great. Okay? Yeah, thanks. Sure. Um, so, there was a question, uh, I think it's interesting to uh, sort of mention this to the uh, all the students as well. So. Um, th there was a question about whether, uh, like, if you go to this slide here, maybe it's better to show you guys. So when you under under sample in this case, the question was, how do you know which two voxels are in the same group in this whole image? There are tens of thousands of pixels there. Right. So the question, the answer is, well, in this case, we're only talking about ray two in the phase encoding direction. 
Okay. So if you want me to tell you what is the, the other group member for this voxel, well, I can tell you right away because it's, it has to be half a field away, uh, half of the field of view away from that voxel. It has to be that here because it's ray two. So in, in ray two case, they has to be half a field of view apart from each other. If you think about ray four, then all of a sudden the group size gets bigger. Instead of two voxels in, in a group, they now have four voxels. And they are all, you know, about quarter of field of view from each other. Does that make sense? So these are already sort of predetermined. There was another question, I forgot what it was. Uh, uh, could you repeat that question? Sorry, what's your name again? Ewan. You, you had another question, right? Uh, yeah. But how typically in your application, like what the way you use for... Um... Oh, right. And you had a question about why there's no no aliasing in the readout direction. Yeah, no readout direction and phase switch. Does that make sense? There's no aliasing in the readout direction, feedbacks? Do you know why? Excuse me? It's uh, basically just the same. Yeah. There's an anti-aliasing filter there. So it's the, the, it, whatever happens outside the field of view is already filtered out before you digitalize it. That's why there's no aliasing in that direction. Uh, I was talk talking to you, you know, if you, if you prescribe a chrono scan um, where one direction is foot to head, one direction is left to right, you probably want to choose left to right to be the uh, phase encoding direction because the other direction is much longer. If you do phase encoding in that direction, it's going to have an aliasing there. But we know that readout, there's no aliasing, so readout has to be the long axis. All right. Any other questions before we move on to a compressed sensor? Okay. Um, compress sensing is <clears throat> is sort of a more recent development. Um, it's only introduced to the MRI community within maybe the past less than ten years, maybe ten years. Um, it's a totally different category of acceleration techniques, and uh, you could also combine these with power imaging. So for compress sensing. You do not need multiple coils. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't use the multiple coil information. It, is, it uses a sparsity in the image. I'll talk about more in the, in the next slide uh, to, um, to to accelerate. Okay. So so what is sparsity? What do you think sparsity is? You know, you're all familiar with JPEG, right? When you when you have take a picture, these days are you know ten megapixels, whatever. And it's going to be a big file. But how come the images or files are only you know, 300K or something? Go ahead. Uh, you can represent the image in a different domain using a smaller number of points. Excellent, yes. So that's all sparsity is all about. You know, you, you, you can see a box, a, a, a picture, there's tens of millions you know, pixels. Every picture has a value there. But if you're smart enough to do some transformation, and in another domain, maybe there's far fewer coefficients you need, to fully represent the image. That's what sparsity is all about. That means, in this particular case, that image, the picture, is sparse in the other domain, okay? Um, and compress sensing is all about sparsity. It takes advantage of sparsity that's inherent in medical images, not just the pictures taken in the zoo, but also the medical images um, to accelerate. And um, uh, you'll learn that, you know, for compress sensing to work, <clears throat> there are basically two very important requirements. One is you have to have a sparsity okay, in a transform domain, all right? Um, I'll talk about later what a domain is. And then a second requirement is a random under sample. Okay. Uh, that's very important actually as well. So how does it work? Um, I'll, sh I'll maybe um, draw on the, uh, the board here. So, so we know there's image, right? There's image. Very cool. There's image X, all right? Can you can you guys see or it's too small? It's the first time I use it. So. Good. All right. 
um, and, and you know this image, and if you do a Fourier transform of x, that's your k space. Okay, <clears throat> and and you know that you do some measurements in uh, in a k space. Okay, let's say your measurement is y. These are your, your k space samples. Okay, so <clears throat> the x is what you're looking for. So in this case, it's all about you know um, solving a matrix and inversion problem. We talked about this in power of matrix. So what 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 you you basically you have to formulate a list of equations, which can be summarized as a times x equal to y. Okay, so again, y is your measurement. <clears throat> A, a is your encoding matrix, okay? So in this case, A can be what? So X is your what you're looking for is your image, okay? So what you want, what you're doing here is, you know, you're looking for a image, but because you have already have some me measurements, you know that there's a Fourier relation between the image and the measurement. So that means, Whatever image you come up with, you, 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 can, you can guess, you can estimate, whatever. But that image, at the location where you do have samples, you have to match those samples. That's what this equation is all about. You know, A is basically, um, it's two matrix, matrices. One is a Fourier encoding. So the Fourier transform, okay? So that means if you have image here, you do a Fourier transform, that gives you the K space, right? But because you only have samples in, in selected locations. So S here is really sort of a sampling function or under sampling function if you under sample, okay? So what it tells you is that, okay, for the image, you know, if you do a free transform and only look at locations where you do have samples, okay, those locations has to match up between the actual measurement and, and your, your prediction based on the, um, uh, your, your x, all right, and um, so, so what is the x then? The x typically is you know the 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 images that best matches the y that give you the x. Okay, if you are fully sampled, then there's no com um, ambiguity about it because you just simply just invert the a. That's going to give you that's going to give you exactly what x is basically inverting a and times y. Okay, but because we're talking about under sampling here, it's a little bit tricky. So now. Remember in parallel imaging, first of all, let's look at this equation, okay? Let's say you're, um, you have um, n voxels to solve for, okay? So the, the x is n, uh, let me just list it here, x is n by 1, okay? And then if it's 256 by 256, then the n will be basically tens of thousands, right, six, six, 63 something, 64,000. Um, so, so that's a big vector, all right? And the y, now, remember we're under sampling. So the number of samples uh, in y will be much smaller, right? If you do, do rate two under sampling, for example, then y will be uh, n minus, uh, n divided by two, by one, it's a vector, okay? So in this case, what is size of A? It's N divided by two by N, okay? Now you immediately notice the problem. What is the problem? Well, it's underdetermined. You have N unknowns, you have N by two, N divided by two uh, measurements, okay? Well. How do we get over this? Get over this with uh, parallel imaging? Well, we add more channels. So you know we make the underdetermined problem to overdetermined problem by adding like four channels. Then all of a sudden your number of measurements, you know, quadruple to 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 n times four, right? And then you can because it becomes the overdetermined problem. If the system is more stable, then you can solve for x. Okay, but in this case we don't have the extra channels because we're not using parallel imaging. So what do we do here? Well, if you 
typically if you say I just want to uh, invert it well it's it's not, if you invert it there's so many different options right there's many options you can you cannot narrow it down just one option for few x so so we have to take a little bit different strategy here so for comfort sensing what we're looking for is okay you know we know there's so many candidates of x that can satisfy this equation okay uh, because it's an underdetermined problem how do we choose from all these good candidates which one is what you're looking for okay um the cs theory tells us okay if you do this if you all these candidates if you minimize what is this this is l11 which which is the absolute value you know, for for the scalar uh, for a vector, it's basically the absolute values of all the elements add up together, okay? So, equal to Okay, it's getting too small here and n minus 1 here. So, the theory tells us if you minimize the L1 norm of x, at the same time subject to the uh, <clears throat> condition that the <clears throat> L2 norm of the difference, this one here, is, is very small, okay? Uh, mathematically, you want it to make it like equal to zero, okay? That, you know, theoretically, that's true. You want, you want them to exactly match your measurement. But in reality, um, this is a very tough to solve for because there's noise, there's all kinds of things. You can never be exactly the same as measurement. So what you want to do is you want to minimize the difference with the measure. So that's what this is all about. Okay, you can choose a very small number, epsilon, so that basically when this is true, you can say, okay, we satisfied, your, our measurement matches the, uh, your, your, um, your calculation. Okay, so this is the equation we're solving for. We're, we're minimizing the L1 norm of your solution um, <clears throat> uh, subject to the condition that it matches the case space measurements at locations where you, you do have samples. Okay, um, this is a very, you know, can be very complex in terms of math, math behind this. Um, but you might want to ask the question, okay, why do you want to minimize the L1 norm? Okay, there's so many norms you can choose from. Why don't you minimize the L2 norm? Which is, when you say L2 norm of X, that's what, that's, that's um, um, some of the squares. Okay, this L1 norm here, L2 norm here. If you, you know, you, the, the problem is that I have so many candidates that satisfy this condition. I just need to choose one. But what is the criteria for choosing this? The CF theory tells us if you use the L1 norm, it gives you a better answer than L2 norm. Why? Okay, so the, the, the hypothesis here is that we have, um, we have sparsity in the image. Okay, that's the key. All right, so, so how does that work? Um, let me just get another piece of paper. Let's let's simplify it, okay, a little bit. Um, so this is a, a n m by one a vector. Let's say in a very simple scenario where I only have two voxels again, okay. So I have f n is equal to two, okay. So that means. The, the size, okay, so that's ax equal to y. Now this is two by one. This y, let's say we do undersampling by rate two. Okay, so this y is really, really just one measurement. And what is the size of a? So one, so one by two, right? Okay, so, so this is basically simplified, simplifies to a very simple linear equation. Let's say x is equal to its elements x1, x2. Okay, then this equation becomes a1 
uh, times x1 plus a2 times x2 equal to y. Okay? Okay, so let me just copy it here because this is important. So basically we're saying we're solving for x1 and x2 so that they satisfy this equation. And we already know what a1 and a2 are. Okay? So what does it look like? If you if you plot, okay, this is x1, x2. Is that represented by a line, a curve? What 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 is it? You know, because there's there's one equation and two unknowns, right? There are many solutions for this, but a, a common, uh, what they all have in common, I guess, is that all the solutions are on the same line. Does that make sense? Right, so this line is, is, rep, is represented by the equation here. So the intercept here, here is what? I don't know what it is. I'll have to calculate it. Okay, <laughs> um, but it's represented by a line. That's important. So now we're saying, okay, all, out of all the solutions that satisfy on, on this line, all the points on this line basically satisfy this equation. So that that's already taken care of. The next question is, there are infinite number of lines and points on this line. How do I know which point is the solution? So that's where this minimization comes in, okay? You could minimize L1 norm and you could minimize L2 norm. I'll show you both scenarios and how it works, okay? So um, before we do that, we have to think about how, how, you know, pictorially, how do you think about this problem? You, you're trying to find a solution, find points on this line that minimize the L1 norm, okay? So what is L1 norm? I'll draw you something like this. So, okay, so what is this? It's a diamond. What, what, what about it? Why do I draw a diamond? Do you see anything that's interesting in this context? Give a hint here. So, so any point on this diamond line, you know, the they correspond to the same L1 norm for x vector. Look at it, you know, x absolute value x1 plus x absolute value x2, they're all the same along this line, along this diamond. Okay, so so the reason I'm drawing this is because okay that's interesting. So you want to find a point on here that minimizes the L1 norm. So what I can do is I could start with a very small L1 norm estimates, little diamond here. I just keep expanding it. Okay, expand it a little bit more. Okay, until some part of the diamond hits the line, then that, that point is your solution. Because you start with a very small L1 norm, you just keep make it bigger, bigger, bigger until you touch the line. Then because you know the solution has to be on that on that straight line. Right? That's the theory, that's you know pictorially what's happening when you solve the equation uh, for this one. Alright, so so, so that's interesting. Now, if you think about it, if you, if you keep expanding, because this is a diamond, when you expand it and uh, you want to find the, uh, where it touches the, the line there, more than likely, one of the uh, uh, corners is going to touch the line first. Statistically, it's more likely, right? Because it, it, just, it just sticks out. I mean, when you, when you expand it, the corner is going to touch the line first. Okay. Um, well, why why is that important? Well, because 
we know, we'll go back to the equation uh, question here. So we know that x is sparse. So what is sparsity? Sparsity means that, um, you know, you, you, you need fewer um, number of uh, samples to represent the whole thing, okay? So if you talk about sparsity in a, um, in a in an image domain, you have two voxels, okay? That means, you know, we know that kind of no, like one voxel is zero, because sparsity means that number of non-zero non back voxels is small, okay? If, if the whole object is a thousand pixels, you have 999 voxels of non-zero, then that's not sparse. But you only have 200 voxels of non-zero, the other 800 is zero, then it, it is sparse. So, but this is a very extreme case where you have two voxels. When you talk about sparsity in two voxel, you can kind of assume one, you know, one voxel is a zero. Only one voxel has non-zero values in it, okay? That's sort of the assumption, okay? Obviously, it gets more complicated when you have more voxels and things like that. But what I'm showing you is that if you say the solution has to be one zero value, then it can only be one of the four points, corners. Because these are only the four points in the, on a diamond that has non-zero values in either x1 or x2. That's where sparsity comes from. So, so that means if you're talking about, okay, we know that's a sparse, then you kind of know that it has to be one of these four points. And when you do this, it happens that it's much more likely that one of these corners is going to hit the line. So now you tell me whether it's going to be, you know, more likely or not to have, um, uh, look at an L1 norm, okay? Because if you look at L2 norm, I'll show you in a, in a few minutes, it's less likely you're going to hit the corners if you do L2 norm. And we know that because of sparsity, we know that solution has to be in the corner, sort of. So, so what is L2 norm? If you know, if L1 norm is a diamond, what is L2 norm shape look like? Circle. It's a circle, yeah. It's a circle. So any, so any, any um, point on this circle has the same L2 norm. So now all of a sudden, if you copy the same line here, and you start with a very small circle, and just keep growing, Do you think it's more likely to hit one of these points or it's going to more likely hit one of the points in between? It's probably one up here, something around there. So, but that point is not sparse because it's got both values non-zero. It's not sparse. So what I'm saying here is that, you know, subject to the condition, if you minimize the L1 norm, you're more likely to find a sparse solution. That's all I'm talking about here. So that's why if you know the subject is already sparse, then L1 norm is going to work better. If it's not sparse, then it's a different story. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so obviously there's a lot of math behind this, um, but, but this hopefully this illustrates uh, the, the point here. Okay, so okay, so so we know the how sort of why L1 norm is important, minimizing L1 norm is important, and let's just take a look at how compare sensing really works in a nutshell. Um, this is some figures that I uh, grabbed from uh, Mickey Lustig paper, who's who uh, introduced uh, the sort of concept of compared sensing into the MR community here. Um, so, so what are we looking at? So, you know, L1 norm is important because sparsity is best uh, associated with L1 norm. Now, the other, the other very important concept is random on the sample. That's something we didn't talk about so far yet. Uh, let's look at a sparse signal here. All right, so this is uh, some kind of signal. And uh, uh, there's many, you know, many sort of points here, but there are only three non-zero points. So you can think about this, okay, this is a pretty sparse signal, right? Um, and that signal can be an object, and uh, uh, it's a one linear object for illustration purposes. So now, 
what's what's gonna happen? What's the case space of the zero? If you have a whole bunch of discrete numbers and you do a Fourier transform, what does it look like? It's, it's something like this. It's not sparse at all. It's not sparse. So, um, and and if you if you do undersampling, so you don't sample all the points here. You sample only selected points. Then it's still not very sparse, right? Uh, the the point the thing is that uh, the, you know alias onto each other. So the big peak here, medium peak and small peak, but they are all sort of overlapped with the alias images. This is the image domain. Sorry, this is not this is not the uh, case space. This is the case space. Okay. If you do case space under sampling and you do Fourier transform back, you get something like this. Instead of that, you get this because of alias. Because you're under sampling, so alias basically because you know, think about it, this big guy here, when it aliases, the alias energy repeats itself every you know number of pixels, and it happens when you do a fold, then uh, a lot of energy actually overlaps with this little peak here. So that makes this peak not you know not visible at all because it's all buried sort of under the alias energy. Okay. So, so that's a regular undersampling. We know we know that very well. When you do regular undersampling, you have alias and you have fold over artifacts. <clears throat> that doesn't work well with the compass sensor because the goal here is I'll show you later in the next slide is you want the, these peaks to stand out. So when you do random undersampling in case space, what happens is that the the alias energy all of a sudden becomes incoherent. They're, they're not repeating itself like very uh, <clears throat> uh, rigorously like every every number of pixels. This all over the place because it's random. When you do a random on the sampling, the energies are, are spread out all over the place so that they more become like more like a noise-like energy. Okay. So in this case, you do eightfold on the sampling, then you know you have a lot of noise here, and this little peak here is kind of undistinguishable from the noise. But that's okay because you have a couple of guys that are standing out. Okay, so what you can do is okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna apply a threshold. So I'm saying okay, anything below this line is noise. Anything above this line is signal. So when you do that kind of thresholding, then you find these two guys here. Okay, okay, that's good. You're missing a little bit here, but you know we'll take care of that. So what do you do? So Detected components, and you know the point spread function, and you, you, you can predict based on the under sampling pattern in the case space what is the aliasing energy look like for these two guys. Okay, so basically you do that and you subtract the remaining signal from what you would get uh, with the calculated uh, sort of uh, noise like energy um, aliasing from these detected signals, and you get something like this. So all of a sudden, the energy from these two big peaks are, are subtracted. You get this much smaller noise level. All of a sudden, this one was previously uh, undistinguishable in the noise. All of a sudden, becomes, you, know, you can do another threshold and find this. Signal. That's really, you know, in a very simple scenario, how really compress sensing works. Okay, so you can, you can tell that without, first of all, you have to be sparse. If this whole thing is just a lot of signal, then there's no standing out. There's everybody is basically the same. Um, and the second requirement is to have to be random on the sound sampling so that your alias energy is more like noise, not a coherent like structural artifact. Okay, these are very, very important requirements. Um, and that both go together hand in hand, that enables sort of compress sensing reconstruction. Um, I don't think we have time to sort of go to a lot of details for this, um, but hopefully this is just give you a sort of very brief introduction, uh, sort of motivation of, of why you know compass sensing work and how, uh, what are the requirements, et cetera. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about uh, type of sparsity. The sparsity is such an important concept <coughs> in uh, compass sensing. Um, <clears throat> we talk about sparsity in domain, right? You know, given going back to the example where you have taken pictures, um, we know that sparsity doesn't necessarily have to be in a picture domain, although it can be. 
Um, it can be any other transformation domain. Uh, it, you know, um, I'll just give you several applications, sort of examples here. Uh, you know, uh, sorry, com contrast enhanced MRI and geography, which is a, a field of MRI where you <clears throat> uh, use MRI to visualize the blood vessels in your body. Okay, so, you know, often use contrast agents. And in this case, you can actually look at the number of pixels that has high signal value. Let's say you have, um, look at somebody's leg, for example, They're, you know, you're interested only in, in a small artery within your leg that has diameter of two millimeters, but your leg, the diameter is, you know, you know tens of 15 centimeters or something. So you can see that the, if you do contrast enhanced MRA, then the image domain is already sparse because the, if you look at the number of voxels that has higher signal, which is a blood vessel, it's very small compared to the total number of voxels within your field of view, which is entirely lack. Okay, so that's already sparsity right there. That you know, there's a lot of work that being done to take advantage of that sparsity uh, in the image domain already. Uh, then the sparsity is not limited to that. You know, there's we talk about transformation domain. Uh, you can do temporal as well. Okay, I'll show you a couple of examples. One of them is, you know, cardiac extending images. If you have a, a beating heart or something moving, okay, you're, somebody is breathing or something, then <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of correlation in time as well. Okay, uh, a good sort of way to think about it is, you know, you have, if I image the whole chest, right, and the heart is only maybe, you know, 10% or even less of uh, the entire area of your field of view, then the heart is beating, but everything else is stationary. So, uh, so there's a, t a lot of basically ninety percent of the tissue they're not changing over time too much. So that's sparsity right there. Right? If you if you take a difference between two, you know, time points, then they're going to be zero all the time. Okay. So what I'm saying is the sparsity can be represented in many different ways, not just an image, not just in the temporal. Uh, sometimes both image and temporal. Sometimes, you know, you, if you took, take a um, uh, like wavelet transform, that's very commonly used for a transform as well. Uh, it turns out a lot of medical images are very sparse in, in a wavelet domain if you do a wavelet transform or a total variation. Uh, there, there are so many different transforms out there that, you know, they're still very active sort of research area. Uh, i just show you a couple of examples. Uh, let me see if I... Yeah, this is this is an MRA example, uh, and geography. This is a, somebody's heart, and you can see the uh, big vessels, the aorta, and all the pulmonary vessels. You know, you can see this is a this is a uh, <clears throat> sort of uh, uh, projection uh, MIP image, okay? Um, but you can see it's very 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 small. So the number of voxels in a in a vessel is very very small compared to the entire body, okay? Uh, you can do some. Uh, 3D renderings like this, uh, yeah, uh, you, you can appreciate, you know, how sparse it is because all the background tissue, all the muscles, uh, the lung, the, you know, the, the brain, all the neck, all these vest, uh, vet, you know, tissues are, are removed by simply just a simple threshold because only the blood vessel signal has signal way above the other remaining tissues and, you know, that's sparsity right there. So there's you know many possibilities and this is a still very active uh, research uh, topic and uh, uh, just so many you know flexibility there you know we talk about the equation here the um, the go back just quickly here that that equation here there are so many possibilities right this is a sort of what we call the com uh, uh, fidelity term means that that's always there in any, every algorithm that simply means that you know. You, you, for places where you do have measurement, you have to match up. So that's as simple as that. That has to be true. But this term, there's a lot of flexibility. Again, this is a, we're talking this example, this is only um, L1 norm of the image itself. So we're talking about image uh, sparsity in this case. But this case can be, you know, the wavelet of X, or it can be the total variation of X. It can be uh, the, the time temporal total variation of x if x is a dynamic series. It can be many other things. 
so so that's why it's such a versatile um, uh, reconstruction sort of framework. Um, and then some other examples like background subtraction, for example. Sure. Um, this is another example. So this is this is a technique to uh, uh, again for MRI geography, but looking at more the blood vessels in the in the leg. You can see that as that's the same uh, example I showed before. If you do the subtraction, systole and diastole of a cardiac cycle, then this is the image you kind of get. You can see that entire the field of view. It's only maybe one percent of the voxel has a value there. So it's a very sparse. So I think it's a tremendous potential there. This kind of application. Uh, can enable is a totally different sort of you know uh, approach for acceleration uh, in MRI, and it can be also combined. This is actually another another uh, kind of temporal. That's what I'm talking about. The heart is beating, right? But all the other stationary tissues are they're really not changing all the time. So that's as far as if you if you take a temporal total variation, which measures the difference between two or two or three several sort of temporal frames, then these regions are very, very sparse, and only the heart has changes from brain to brain. Okay. That's a dynamic MRI geography data. You can see that. It's, it's got sparsity in the image domain and temporal domain as well. Okay. Um, so as I said, you know, this is a very active research field, and um, I think I'll, I'll end there. And uh, if you have any questions, just let me know. <coughs> Average, like I said, was high. It was 14.6 plus or minus 1.1. Uh, so total was 